Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, Agnes. It's painting our nails. <laughs> Very focused. Do you see Ruth, Agnes? Yeah. Yeah. How's your new place? Nice. Um, this is my um, pretty fabulous study. Oh, oh nice. nice. Fancy. There. Fancy. No, no food truck outside. <laughs> no food trucks outside. I mean, I do have. <laughs> I love filters. There's a list of filters. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I wasn't going to show you my unmade bed. <laughs> At least not just students. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all have unmade beds uh, these days. Yeah. Right, Agnes? I have this try. fabulous. Oh, nice. I really love that I have. Um, that I have, um, you know, I have this little entrance, oh, yeah. and then I have a rather large, lovely space. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful! Yeah, and you see so the it, look at the living room. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Look, look how bright! But yeah, it almost looks like a Berlin apartment. Yes, um, and the kitchen is super small, but I have this fabulous um furniture here that's left over from an ex exhibition ah so nice. that's pretty amazing yeah and i have my art on my wall which of course i'm absolutely loving uh, uh including this which you might remember no, oh yeah didn't. for sure yeah you see what you, you know. see what do you see what the painting says read it no yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's actually rather sad. You might remember um, that the first exhibition I did was about um, to the testimonies of children who were kept in detention centers alongside the border between. Yeah. Um, United States and Mexico, and um, they had been recorded and translated into English by lawyers who, who were able to go into the detention centers uh, end of 2019 um, because of the Flores Agreement, which is a kind of um, a result of a court case um that said okay children need to have access to water and food children need to have a mattress children need to have access to a lawyer and children need to have access to doctors me medical attention well turns out hardly any of this was happening in fact there are huge human rights um uh, problems with how the kids were kept in this detention centers here and I mean, there are kids dying, there are kids sexually abused, and there's kids, um, that is the lights are on all day and all light, light is by a young, little young boy from Guatemala, who's describing that they can't really sleep because the lights are always on. Yeah. So. In the form that, of future, of course. That was a work by Mary Ellen Carroll. Um, um, Pope L. Julie Meretu, uh, Dan Graham, Lawrence Wiener, um, Michael Rakovich, all of them contributed to that exhibition. They all took, chose, a, chose a testimony from a child and then reacted to it in an artwork. And then these artworks, we showed these artworks. That was the first exhibition I did here in DC. We showed these artworks and then they were later on sold in this charitable sale in a very interesting way, which assured that um, you can't speculate with these works. So you can't sell them. If you sell them, you have to give half of it to the artists. Yeah. What you make to the artists. Mm. So 
Um, anyway, I think students are tuning in. Yeah. So, um, everyone, welcome. People are coming in. And uh, for those of you who haven't met Ruth yet, uh, this is Ruth Nowak. Very happy to have her at least virtually again this year. Um, and very sorry about uh, strange circumstances that you, know, you can't be here in person. Um, but meanwhile, um, there's still a lot that we can share through Zoom. So we just do our best. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron and, Ian, Aaron and Aaron and Aaron and Aaron. I'm always finding it difficult to pronounce these two for inviting me. Thank you, students, for wanting to hear from me again. I really appreciate it. I really do. Um, and it's lovely. I've had some studio visits this morning and met some familiar faces. And it's always easier the second time around. You, even if you don't, if you haven't talked for quite some time, it's kind of nice to see faces that you already know. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I would very, very much appreciate it if keep, people would not just hide behind their names uh, and have their Zooms on. It's, you have all now been doing this for more than a year. You know what it's like. But it's, um, it's just a question of energy and for me a little bit also about respect to, um, to try to create as much of a presence with each other as we can. So thanks. Um, I also want to dedicate what I'm talking about today um, to someone, but before I say that, I'm hoping that I won't be talking too long. Some, most of it I will be reading, but I'll imp improvise a little bit because I am hoping to engage at the end of it in a discussion with you or in a conversation with you about the topics. Um, many of you will be in the seminar, so we can also continue there, but um, just to provide this audience, I don't know exactly how many of you will be in the seminar with the possibility to engage with a, to a topic in a more active way. I would like to, I hope that we'll have some time at the end. So I'm dedicating this to Lauren Berland. Any of you know her or know of her? So she's a US scholar. She was working at the University of Chicago and she wrote amongst other things on issues of intimacy in relation to citizenship. Um, and oh, actually it's not a she, I'm sorry. Very, very, very sorry, I apologize. But most importantly, they influenced the whole generation of my queer feminist materialist, new materialist friends and peers. So my generation people, were very much influenced by them. Lauren Berland was 63 when they died yesterday of cancer. And um, it's been going a bit like shockwaves um, through the people I uh, know um, because they, their thinking and their writing and their whole apt, uh, attitude um, seem to be very important to my generation in their text on cruel optimism. And I think teaching on Zoom is partially an effect of cruel optimism. In their text on cruel optimism, they say it's not the object that is the problem, but how we learn to be in relation. I um, urge you all to look at uh, their work online because at the moment critical inquiry for instance has made it taken down their paywall so people can look at the um at their texts because um uh, because of this death this very 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 recent death so um Aaron, can you put the first slide on i'm gonna do a screen share so just tell me um in a moment, if it is working. Can everyone? Oh. 
We have this, but yeah. we have this. Yes, we we do see something. Yeah, that would be great. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So today I will be addressing you from the point of view of a practitioner, someone who makes exhibitions. In this role, I will not define for you the boundaries between making art and making an exhibition, or consider the categories with which both forms of production might be differentiated using philosophical methods, for example. I will not look at the functions of art and exhibition making within a contemporary world ruled by transnational capitalism using, in the widest sense, sociological tools. Instead, I will speak a bit of my own practice, which is not that of a professional curator, though by all intents and purposes, I function as one in the art world. The reason I choose not to describe myself as a professional curator, though I work as one and have described myself as one many times, have to do with genealogy and with attitude. On genealogy, the simplest way to say this is the purpose of the first exhibitions I made in the 1990s were to create a framework for the display of my own artworks. Though already in those very first shows, an emphasis was put on reception, on the audience. How to create an audience which truly engages with the works? That was our question as artists turned curators. And how to make sure that this audience was not one, of sim one simply of our peers in order to have an impact on the world beyond the art public. Even for young artists showing work in 1993, this question was relevant. And here you see um, one of these very early shows. Um, it was um, a series of shows called Loki, and they were inspired very much by the apartment movement in Eastern, in the Eastern Bloc at the time. Um, we were living in Vienna at the time, and uh, Vienna was in the beginning of the 90s very much influenced by the Eastern Bloc, very different from um, many other countries in West Europe, because there have been traditionally uh, many, many political and geopolitical reasons for that. Um, and in, um, in the Soviet bloc, um, there were artists working independently um, of state structures and they made, but a lot of them were also dependent on state structures um, because artists were paid um, by the state to be artists. And um, whether they were independently or not, a lot of them made independent exhibitions in their own homes, in their apartments. Um, there was a very important one, um, uh, um, the, the, the apartment of Sofia Kulik and Kvi Kulik, then her husband in Warsaw, where a lot of people met and a lot of work was shown um, from all over the East. Um, uh, Sofia Kulik also has one of the largest uh, archives of male art in the world uh, because that's how they were also corresponding. So they were making their own st um, structures to display and discuss art. And as young artists, we were very, very much influenced by that. And so we started beginning of the 90s to make these shows that were in people's apartments. And the idea was always to make to show the work uh, and at the same time bring together three four, three to three um, segments of an audience. One was our friends. The second was the friends of no, no, that's too quick. Go back, Aaron. Yes, thank you. The second one was um, the odd the friends of the people whose apartments it was. And the third was we always invited someone to talk about the work or another issue and then we'd ask those to bring their friends as well. And so then we'd have this mixture of people and in this case um, it's a Berlin apartment um, 
And in another case, it was an apartment in Hamburg, in a very bourgeois apartment. But you know, it changed up. Um, and that's something that has kind of stayed with me, this idea that you're kind of generating your own, own audience. And you really think about that. You don't just assume that your friends are going to be coming, but you really think of how can you, um, you know, get people to come, but also um, um, profit from coming. And um, how can you make an exchange that's worthwhile for everyone? So um, this series of, of exhibitions was called Loci, lo from Locus, the plural of Locus. And um, yeah, just leave that there for now. On attitude, so that's genealogy. On attitude, to simplify, making exhibitions were, was always more important to me than making it as a curator. What is the difference, you might ask? Well, in the time I was growing into curating between the 1990s and 2007, uh, 2007 as the curator of Document at 12, I was unable to deny this identity anymore. I was the curator of one of the most important exhibitions in the world. Um, so, but in that time between the 90s and 2007, um, exhibition making came to be defined as a profession. It, and it was a highly uh, popular profession to boot in case the creation of these curator stars, uh, like originally Harald Seemann, who didn't even try to be a curator star, I, I'm sure he wasn't, but someone like Obrist, who made it uh, a real, um, was very successful as um, at self advertisement and as self um, uh, marketing. Um, these these examples caused a lot of very young people to decide they wanted to become curators and start to study curating. So in the 90s, actually end of the 80s, some of these first programs where you can study to become a curator, um, start to get, um, get installed and established first in Grenoble and then in, at the Royal College of Art in London. And um, before that, uh, you'd come, there was a big difference between those who were making exhibitions in exhibition in museums. They were, um, you know, curare means like taking care of. They, these were people who were often scholars who had studied art history, and then they would be going through the ranks of the, of the museum. And you'd like you every five years every eight years you would make a scholarly researched exhibition so that's how you'd be making exhibitions or you'd be installing the permanent collection but it's a very different work from how we are perceiving of curators nowadays um or you'd be like Seman, uh, independent friends with artists and um kind of you know organize exhibitions self-organized exhibitions um, um there was a famous one called a bit later when that was already more professionalized called chambre d'amis by jan hood also in in apartments um, so these people then became known for making exhibitions um, and exhibitions of contemporary art it also coincides with uh, it also coincides with uh, new valuation of contemporary artwork. Uh, before the 80s, contemporary artwork is collected, but it's not collected at this, these prices. Uh, in the 80s, the prices for contemporary art goes up, and this most probably has to do with money laundering. That was a time when money really got laundered and art was discovered as something that can be used for money laundering. And that's when these prices went up. So this is not independent of what else is going on in the world. And with that also comes this figure, this star figure, 
who becomes as important as the artist and in some cases becomes even more important. I remember being in uh, Korea around 2010 and people were telling me, oh, this used to be an artist, but he's now turned into, he had the opportunity to become a curator and you're making more money, you're more of a star as a curator than an artist. And so that became a big thing. I think this era is over. I don't think people care about curators anymore. So um, I think it's it really went like this. It peaked and then it went back down again. I mean, of course, there are differences and there's curators with lots of power and others that are not having so much power. Please, when you're starting out to do research on all of this, be aware of the fact that the art world is very, very um, amnesiac. And so things get rediscovered again and again and again. And then, and that's fine. Every generation has a right to rediscover it. But the interesting thing is that a lot of things also get um, forgotten. And then what gets rediscovered is usually those who are powerful. So someone is saying Massimiliano did this amazing thing and then Massimiliano journey and no one looks at the fact that maybe a woman did that 20 years earlier and or a collective did that similar things 20 years earlier and Massimiliano journey is just smart and how he's mark marketing whatever it is he's doing. So that is very much a question of access. And then, of course, here in the United States, the role of the curator is even more um, complex because there's so much, it's so much dependent on a very market oriented art system. Not every country has such a market oriented art system and very much on fundraising so that similar to how you make it as an artist, it's very important to project individualism and project power and project all these things in order to be able to work at all. Whereas there are other places where the infrastructure maybe is different, where people can project, uh, can work and do interesting stuff on all different levels. Um, so, I serve on this wave now, I call myself a curator. And most importantly, that is because for the past 10 years after I did Documenta, more than 10 years now, I was freelancing and found it necessary in order to get jobs to project that. So, um, so I did that similarly um, as many other people. Um, but it is not what defines my practice. Um, making a good exhibition defines my practice. And sometimes being a curator and making a good exhibition clash. And just to give you an example of where this, this clash for me personally, I was invited to curate the Ljubljana Graphic Arts Biennial. That's one of the more older biennials. Um, it's existed since Tito invented it, I think, in the 60s. Um, it's very important, um, especially because printmaking is so important for um, many non-Western countries and remains important. But this, um, when Tito invented that biennial, it was, you know, Yugoslavia was part of the non-alignment movement. So um, uh, people from African countries, people from Arabic countries sent over prints. Um, so they were, that was a kind of a hub for an international exchange of art, which influenced then in turn the Yugoslavian scene um, and the Yugoslavian scene influenced um, non-Western countries. So um, it's got an interesting tradition. It's got a fabulous archive, et cetera, et cetera. And so they invited me a few years ago um, to do, um, to, to curate that um, show. And I proceeded to for two months, um, but told them I was not going to invite 200 artists because the budget was very, very low and I did not want to exploit the artists. I don't want to work like that. And so I said, let's reduce the number of artists 
radically so that each of the artists have some money to do a work that they are happy with, proud of. And on top of that, I was at that point, together with many artists, very interested in the failure of globalization and the failure of transmission between cultures and to rethink after this first wave of enthusiasm about globalization, to rethink of what it needs in order to come together and what we need to change in our way of displaying and thinking about art in order to make a more equal conversation between centers of power and, and, and periphery peripheries. And so I was going to call the exhibition Herding Cats. Um, after two months of working on this, it became very clear that the institution was frightened of this idea, that, was, that it was very frightened of the idea that I would address the failure of, of a global exhibition, the failure of coming together. And they kept saying, what will politicians do? And if you only invite 40 artists instead of 200, won't it lose value? Won't it lose its appeal? And uh, so after two, two months, they uninvited me. And um, someone who was like um, of the generation of a former student from the United States, from England, took over the whole exhibition and did it no one ever really heard of it it was just there and gone like many other biennials and it was a lost opportunity but um basically that kind of experience happened not because i was so revolutionary or radical but it happened because i was just not not even purposely, but just not conforming to the status quo of how this machine needs to be fed, this machine of the art world needs to be fed, and how the curators are part of that administrative, exploitative machine and process. Um, and I really didn't even know how to be that. It was just, it wasn't even that I was so purposely be trying to subvert it, not at all. I really would have liked to have done this exhibition and some others where I've also been uninvited. Um, so, um, so I think this is, makes a difference to a kind of prof, um, professionalism that nowadays um, is how we encounter most curators. This idea that you're, you're making this because you wanna say something, you're making this because you're in cahoots with the artists you're working with, you're making this for yourself and for an audience that you were really thinking about and you're not necessarily making this in order to, to, to further your career. So that's an attitude that's closer to how many artists I know work, who are also quite independent on, uh, um, of the market. And again, not because they choose to be, but just because their practice doesn't fit. Yeah. So it's not that these artists are more radical than others. And I do commend anyone who can make money off their profession. I'm not against professionalization as such. And I'm not against artists making money, but um, it just so happens that there are a lot of artists I know who, who I'm interested in just don't, um, they're spectacularly unsuccessful in attaching to a way of making money off their practice. There are people who have been looking into both categories and functions of art versus exhibition making for some time now. Even in 2014, the philosopher Peter Osborne comes in his book, Philosophy of Contemporary Art, that's a book I recommend, to the statement that, and I quote now, the art market may still be trading in individual works, but it is the exhibition that is the unit of artistic significance and the object of constructive intent. 
Osborne makes a convincing generalization, and it is one that throws any categorical boundary between art and exhibition making into question, because it dem demonstrates that a shift of function and meaning from one side to the other is not only theoretically possible, but might have already taken place. Yet as a practitioner, my claims are positioned on another level, on one that allows for individual instances of artworks and exhibitions to carry discursive weight. It might very well be that when all is said and done and power relations taken into the equation, we must follow Osborne's assertion. But from my position as a practitioner, it makes sense to hold onto another view for now, one that follows historian Stephen Greenblatt's argument, and this is an argument from the 1980s, that capitalism is less to be criticized for its homogenizing force, but for producing a regime in which the drive for differentiation and the drive of monological forms of organization are oscillating so rapidly that a false simultaneity is suggested. If this were the case, it would make sense to slow down and to look more closely at all those examples possibly in breach of the pattern described by Peter Osborne. I won't do that today though, and instead continue to discuss, to discuss the issues uh, from a more biographical perspective. Let me declare though, that for every differentiation between artistic practice and exhibition making that I sought to posit during my preparation for this lecture, I found counter examples. Every time I tried to ascribe a certain category of function to either one or the other, it would not stick. Thus, at least for today, I would claim that neither the artist as curator nor the curator as artist are particularly transgressive concepts because the borders between both practices have been fluid for quite some time now. Maybe the shifts in meaning production that we are experiences experiencing are caused by shifts in socioeconomic structures. But maybe we are just looking at the phenomena with another perspective, a change of a set of parameters. Um, in 2007, on the occasion of Document at 12, the artistic director and I declared that the exhibition is a medium. And this statement most probably would not have been heard so loudly had we been isolated in our approach. So that is, I think, is a real shift in thinking about exhibition making. When you're not thinking of exhibition making as something that is administrative or that is organizational, but when you're thinking it as, of it as a form of expression, as a form of creative expression. And now you can show the next image. Again, at that time in the 90s, we were not really thinking about uh, documenting very much. And we also didn't have the money to document well. So um, I apologize for um, funny photos that don't really show much. Um, but this is from, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going back a little bit in my text, but that's okay. Leave the image up. Yet at the same time, our declaration was deeply personal by the idea that the, um, that the exhibition is a medium. The outcome of a curatorial practice that started in 1992 with a series of exhibitions titled Loki. Self-organized in private flats and inspired by Eastern European formation of a civil society within the private sphere, as well as by the feminist critique of the Habermasian public-private dichotomy, it was our first experiment in audience formation. Just as our texts at the time, the exhibitions were anti-institutional in their impetus, coming respectively out of an artistic practice and an art historical education. We saw making art, producing theory and staging exhibitions as three forms of doing the same thing. 
They were tools for finding out things. Things we don't understand as one of our exhibitions was called. Analysis of the state of the world, engagement in our immediate surroundings, formulation of utopia and a theory of aesthetics, the intention to provide artists as well as our potential audience with some means of political agency and to instill the latter with a sense of their own emancipatory potential. All those concerns seem to be not only compatible with each other, but to be somehow interconnected. We took our theory from those we saw as similarly politically engaged and extemporized the way. Um, so just to give you an example, I'm not sure how much I'm actually really talking about that. But I'll show you. Um, so this was an exhibition called um, um, Scenes of a Theory. And it made the claim that, um, that within art and within discourse about art, certain philosophical and political issues that had been um, posed as problems or questions, be it non-binary thought, non-binary thinking, um, uh, were already addressed and solved. So even in earlier artistic practice. And so we took a series of categories that were important in theoretical discourse at the time, for instance, one to do with the gaze, one to do with the sexualized body and so on. And we made these screens, uh, which you can see here now, if you look carefully, and I'll show you, go to the next picture. That was our catalog, Scenes of the Theory, the artwork as agent of filmic discourse, because we were very influenced by feminist film theory at the time. And the, go to the next one. That's our catalog. And now go to the next one. And then we made these, and we made these arguments and these arguments were with text and with images and these most of these images were artworks i don't know if you can um this is a famous photograph and i know the name um, escapes me um this person has dyke tattooed on her back god she's a famous lesbian photographer from the states <sighs> sorry afternoon um on the la down left corner, you see Daniel Buren. Um, a bit further up, you see a still from a film by Heke Sanders. You see a tattoo by Valley Export, and you see um, you see a work by Eva Hesse in its original form of being um, displayed. And there are um, then te texts and um, quotes. Um, that are at, are on the same par as these images. So the argument that we're making is made by text plus images. It's not just made by text or images, and we don't really make an an, an argument that is pre display. It's an it's it the the what we're trying to find out is we find out by making the display. And so this is um, not unlike, and we were very influenced by, it's not unlike the Warburg um, um, Builder Atlas, the image atlas, and show the next work. And Warburg's image atlas is another of those, I think it was made in the 20s and it keeps being rediscovered again and again by every generation. It just had a large exhibition, which is probably very well digitized and online in Berlin at the, um, at the um, doesn't matter. If you Google it, you'll find it easily, but um, and this is just one of his examples. And Warburg was an art historian, but not only. And the interesting thing is that he's actually really looking for 
um, forms that are rep repeated throughout art history and cu cultural, cultural production. Um, he looks at um, advertisement, he looks at documentary photos, he looks at art and he compares and contrasts and he does so very much in a visual way where this is not necessarily even argued through text. Um, he sought to be a empirical role. He, he was um, um, trying to set up a form of science. Um, what is Cassils? Yeah, I, Amy, you're writing something in the chat. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I was not looking at the chat. Maybe we do that later on, otherwise I lose my concentration. But, um, but we were influenced by that, by this idea that actually the visual realm is um, not only important for how we see the world, but also how um, so important for how we know the world and what kind of knowledge can be even produced. And that's where we are, we're engaging in, and we're very much led also by an older generation of artists who are quite politically engaged, who are engaging in similar issues, like Martha Rosla or Alan Secula in, in this country. So Warburg, whose atlas has been rediscovered again and again, engaged in aesthetic speculation that was seeking to become scientific method. And it evolved in one of those niches of science where science allows itself to act speculative. What is interesting to me, however, that this is not so different of how Miklos um, Peternak, a Hungarian theorist, describes artistic research. In the article, Art Research Experiment, Scientific Methods and Systematic Concepts, which I first came across in the catalog to the 2004 exhibition Beyond Geom Geometry, curated by Lynn Selivansky. This is, was a very important um, show, um, not just in the EU, uh, because it, it was the first one that looked at minimalism and geometric abstraction, not just for the US, but and the West, but included South American and Central European work. Um, that was a, an important step, 2004, that's when the art, Western art world starts to wake up to the fact that maybe this, um, this West, Western centralism with New York as a center and maybe Los Angeles as a periphery, but still part of the center and London and Berlin and, and Paris is not so interesting and that there have been modernisms all over the world and interesting artistic production that, um, that we need to kind of teach ourselves about very quickly. So that's like the beginning of the 2000s when that is starting to happen. And um, at that time, especially when it comes to formalism or political formalism, it was so interesting to see that inter similar things had been happening since the 50s in Eastern Europe and in South America. And that this exhibition, which I saw in Miami in 2004 um, or five, um, this exhibition was one of the first here in the United States where that was shown and integrated. Nowadays, of course, we have curators like Natasha Ginvala in Berlin, or Grace Sambo in Jakarta, or Gabi Nkobo in, um, in Cape Town, or Cosmin Costinas in, in um, Hong Kong, or Maria Berrios from Chile um, in Cap Copenhagen, who um, know, can play this like in their sleep and who are who have done spent their young lives researching non-western art or who are coming from non-western perspectives and they're functioning very well in the west um because you know things have changed a lot in the past 20 years and i'm really grateful for that but again um especially here in the united states that is often still not received so much which i find super interesting and and worrisome, even though there's so many artists who are from all over the world working in this country and being received in this country. Um, 
but it's still this kind of exoticism that's attached to art coming from elsewhere. So Miklas Petrnak describes, to go back to Petrnak, and so I saw this exhibition in Miami, got the catalog and read um, this article by this Hungarian I had not heard of before, Miklas Petrnak. I never heard of him afterwards, but it's been an important text on artistic research for me personally. And he describes artistic research as if the experimental work, which is both proposal and end result, could somehow serve as the basis for some theory that may elaborate, interpret, or even complete it. So what he's trying to say up is that the, that artistic research constructs um, its experiments with a kind of promise that is a self-fulfilling promise this promise of what can be found out, but because it's set up like this, it is being found out. So it's a bit different than scientific research, even though it kind of seems to be doing the same thing. And often artists produce knowledge that's absolutely essential for us. And also research that's absolutely essential for us. For instance, the artist um, Ines Duyak, who has started to research textiles from the ends when no one else was doing it in, you know, people were doing it for all their, um, as curators of some kind of ethnographical museums, but they were not looking at textiles together with indigenous rights, together with labor struggles, together with collection, poli colonialist collection policies, together with trade. And, and and so on. And that, and that um, uh, Ines Duyak made a book, researched this for 10 years, published a book with all this called Loom Shuttles for Paths. And that's just one example where um, knowledge is produced that should have and could have been produced in the academic realm, could have been reduced, uh, produced within a museum and hasn't been produced because of power relations or because people have just been obtuse. So I'm not saying that um, there is less validity in artistic research, just that Petternak is kind of um, describing or defining it as some as working a little bit different in how it sets up proposal and shows result. So this proposition that the process of coming about an artwork, which then manifests itself as both proposal and end result, that this process is based on the promise of arriving at some kind of result, some theory that may elaborate, interpret, or even complete the experiment. This proposition is not very far from our aim, early claims on curating. So we're doing an exhibition because we want to find out something. So it's not even very far from how I would describe my intentions today, to illuminate the things in such a way as to affect in their constellation an indeterminacy between idea and matter. And in that, to affect some moment of understanding, of insight, of perception, which is more than the sum of its parts. Take the constellation at document at 12, and now I need the next image. Of the photography documenting an untitled experimental work from 1968 by Graciela Carnevale. She was a very important and continues to be a very important Argentinian artist who was one of the first to who did who organized both in terms of outside of the institution in but also together with people who were non-artists. So they, they did an exhibition called the first avant-garde biennial of the avant-garde in 68, which was, uh, or I think it was 68, which was done in Rosario in a kind of center of where um, that had been like the production of agrar um, of all photos in, um, in Argentina, which became a monopolist by the oligarchy in Argentina, so they were only producing sugar anymore. And this resulted in poverty amongst the farmers on a large scale. So artists went there to organize together with unionists to deal with that. 
to deal with coffee and sugar monopolies. And they call this organization, they call this exhibition the first biennial of the avant-garde. It's quite seminal. Um, their collective was called Tukoman Arde, Tukoman Burns. Um, so um, I think that was in Rosario. She comes from Rosario, sorry. It was in Tukoman. Um, so, but anyway, before she was involved in that, she was already very interested in this question of how to break out of the art um, at the kind of framework that controls and defines art that is institutional. And you see here this performance of hers where she had an opening in the gallery and she basically locked in the gallery at, um, uh, public into the gallery. And people didn't notice that the door was locked, but they didn't really know what to do. And it took someone from the street to take a stone and, and just throw in the gallery window. And then people escape, escape through this broken gallery window onto the street. And this becomes kind of a metaphor for this um, leaving the art institution towards um, life and toward that is so important in the 60s and beginning of the 60s, 70s, not only in, in Southern America, but, but actually um, all over the world. So we um, showed this work at Documenta um, 12 together with and a sculpture, the sculpture called Song from 2004 by John McCracken. Carnivale locked um, unwitting visitors to the opening of her show in Rosario into the gallery. And for an hour, the spectators gesticulated through the window until someone from the outside of the gallery bro broke the glass pane. Now, our constellation in this case of Documenta, which is, was a large scale exhibition with 750,000 people in 100 days, is a bit of a joke because instead of stepping out or into freedom, the people seem to be stepping back into another exhibition space, the exhibition space of a Documenta, where an abstract sculpture awaits them. But despite this trite analogy, the constellation illuminates an aporia of avant-garde. The contra contradiction between its need for the white cube as a support for its appearance as art and its desire to cross over into the social realm in order to effect change. And thus, while reaffirming the artistic act, the constellation also serves to debunk the work's mythical status. McCracken's sculpture is equally drawn out, not only by its direct confrontation with an overtly activist work, which calls into question its autonomous self-sameness, but also by its lighting, which determinately refuses to support either naturalization or fetishization. You might be noticing this, it's not, um, you know, how it's, how it's lit, it's lit not in the way that conventionally sculptures are lit in contemporary exhibition spaces. Something is missing from the story I'm telling you. It might simply be the genealogy of exhibitions we made between 2092 and 2012, um, 2007, sorry, when Documenta happened. If I were to narrate this for you, our reasoning for a politicized affirmation of aesthetic autonomy and our increasing emphasis on audience as an integral part of the formation of an exhibition might become legible. So that when we're saying an exhibition is the medium, and that was our main text for our documenta catalog, and it was a very, very short text. People said we are anti-theoretical because we're not publishing books and books with theory, even though we both came from Boga and I, the artistic director and I both came from theory and we were very much theoretically informed, but we thought that the argument needs to be made by the ex exhibition itself. So this was very much that to say that an exhibition doesn't exist without its audience and the audience of an exhibition doesn't exist without the exhibition. These are self-defining each other. So it's this act of 
of looking at an exhibition that makes the exhibition valuable and makes that act of looking mean something. And in that way, um, it's a medium. Uh, it's not just a medium of transporting curatorial thought to someone, but it's a medium in that interaction between um, this act of perception. So, but instead of going on into this direction, um, I'd like to supply you with another link that was important in my formation as a, a curator, one to an artwork that deeply influenced my thinking. Uh, by Argentinian French artist Alejandra Vera and her first maquette sans qualité from 1996. And that's the next issue and picture. So this was a work, um, um, these collages, picture collage of pictures on two walls. And I saw this first in 1996 through um, the windows of a closed gallery. I was in Paris by chance and we we're walking past this gallery. I didn't know this gallery and I looked in and I was immediately drawn to it. The gallery was closed the next day I come in to look at it. The gallery owner gets super excited that this foreign curator is interested in this work and calls up the artist and says, listen, there are these foreign curators here. Do you want to come in and talk to them about your work? And she responds, no, I'm at a political protest. I don't have time. Um, that's how I got to know Alejandra in 1996. And I am still friends with her still. We're practicing together still. She was extremely influential on my own thinking and my work. So here we are, we lack the audience. So what does an um, um, artist turned curator with an art historian training do. She writes an article about it because the act of writing is for me like the act of curating a way to figure something out, the way to understand what's happening here. Um, so uh, Rian, uh, um, Alejandro Vieira's installation is comprised of two tableaux of laser copies affixed directly to the walls. The first one consisting of a regular grid of same size photographs and the second one still grid like but displaying a variability of in sizes and placement of the pictures. And can you turn to the next one? Thank you. As most of the photographs on the first wall are most most of them are severely cropped, revealing little more than details, it is necessary to refer to the attending legend up on the right hand side, upon which it becomes clear that all of these images have been sourced from various print media, citing articles on politics, economy and culture, as well as advertisements. The photographs depicting, amongst other sujets, Sartre, Le Pen, Mitterrand, Bill Clinton, Helmut Kohl, Roland Barthes, and Tarzan, have undergone a displacement that emphasizes the surface quality of mass media imagery. Long before Apple enticed us to accept this as the most ordinary form of image consumption. Emptied of their former content, there's nevertheless enough going on in this constellation of images to provoke our curiosity and thus calling upon a certain gaze that calls the original information by piercing together caption and photograph and thus imposes order where chaos reigned. We are satisfied by uncovering a visual joke here and there, forgetting that we are performing a type of modern subjectivity exemplified by the analytical sleuth. Only when we touch upon an image that turns out to depict pars pro toto for the structural violence of media imagery, dead bodies, remnants from a killing spree by the Nicaraguan National Guard, do we stop? It might be argued that the curiosity that leads us to search beyond the surface of what, what, what we are presented with by mainstream media is a prerequisite for political agency. On the other hand, the subject's gesture of inquiry and staging of reflexivity, 
which is basically induced by the considerable amount of time a viewer has to spend searching out the details of the tableau, moving back and forth between individual images and the small captions on the right. Here is the danger of inducing nothing but intellectual self-satisfaction, eclipsing both the subject's own voyeurism and his or her or their lack of political engagement. So we think we're already engaging because we're looking at this and we are deciphering it when the fact is, is that actually political engagement or not, or what is that? The all over of the pattern grid simultaneously produces an effect of homogeneity. We seem to perceive of a whole world made out of a wealth of singular stories. The tableau visualizes this kind of constructivity of a whole thus potentially allowing us to see that we might also make other kind, another kind of world. Yet our own need for imagining that we are ourselves whole, all seeing beings, lets us lose sight of this. An actual revisioning is only ever possible in a particular situations for particular sites and a particular public. So what I'm saying here is actually that, you know, you can't just do an intellectual movement in your head and have solved certain political problems because they need to be solved over and over again in every particular situation that we come into. And I think that's what Lauren Berlant's quote in the beginning is also referring to. It's not the object, but it's this relation that we need to think about. What relations are we in here right now? I mean, right now you're listening and I'm talking, right? I have the floor, but I'm almost done. The second tableau, and now I need the next image expands upon a single image taken from the first one, the photograph of a woman in black and white. It shows Leila Zana, a Kurdish politician, at that time and for 10 more years, a political prisoner in Turkey. She's actually still in, in prison. The image is called from an article focusing on her husband, a former mayor of Diyarbakir and his children. The newspaper caption adds the information of her imprisonment almost as an after fact. According to the legend, two more of the images depict Zana, who has become a martyr for the Kurdish cause. She was thrown into prison originally because she, she spoke in parliament in Kurdish, and Kurdish is a language that's not allowed in Turkey. But but there are also two further large and several small photographs of a woman obviously mimicking Sana. The caption reads, Hiam Abbas, actress, interpreting photographs of Leila Zana. A still from the Palestinian film Haifa also shows Abbas in her role as Um Said. <clears throat> the final element of this bricolage are subtitled stills from a TV documentary of Pier Paolo Pasolini. <clears throat> Contrary to the first tableau, this constellation consists of a diverse semantic structure. Found images are supplemented by photographs taken by the artist herself in a kind of dialogue with the text that appears on the stills of Pasolini. And now a quote, <clears throat> today's regime is democratic, but whereas fascism never accomplished total assimilation, the dispositif of power of the consumer society has managed just that, to destroy particularity, to eliminate it from reality. It happened so fast, no one ever noticed. Pasolini's juxtaposition emphasizes a similar kind of structural violence that, to that depicted in Riera's first tableau. Yet, given the fact that as the first tableau demonstrates, particularity and assimilation are no longer incompatible, this, his lament seems slightly nostalgic. Riera initially counterposes 
the assimilative image flow with a singular image of iconic materiality, which he subsequently channels with the help of dialogical trope into a multi-dimensionality that pierces the media surface. The transfer of focus from her husband to Zana herself is assisted by the ironic caption of the family's mirror image. Hiam Abbas in her flat with her children and her husband. That's um, to the right, the second row to the right, the large image. Rera actualizes the black and white photograph of Sana with a reenactment in color and uses those reenactments to question the interpretation of the newspaper images. By adding another image of Abbas in a role extraneous to the story of Reina Zana, she circumvents the danger that the actor herself is de-individualized, made to re represent solely another woman. Finally, in the very center of the tableau, Reira allows photographs of both women to appear in a friendly communion. It is an effective staging, counting on the power of images to subvert structural violence. And I, for one, feel drawn to this particular endeavor. Is the fictivity, with its slightly sentimental invocation of female solidarity, strong enough to counter the gendered dichotomy of women, woman as an image and man as a speaking subject? Riera refrains from citing a single word of the writings of Sana. But because my interest in her figure has been awakened by the installation, yet left dissatisfied, the gap between an artwork's rhetoric and my own responsibility, not only to seek information, but also to act upon it, is made all the more apparent. Upon my first encounter with this work by Alejandra Riera, I did embark upon a former form of counter propaganda, not unlike Hito Steyl does in her early film November, which also referenced the Kurdish struggle and the question of the image of woman within that struggle. But in the end, I concluded that both Rieras and my representations have failed to make the connection between a feminist narration of On De La Zana and our analysis of the mass media structural violence count. That is, I felt that we had not succeeded in making it politically effective. A political act that results in real social change can never be carried out by singular subjects, artworks, or texts. I wrote in 1997. And I continued, we need to change subjectivities and apparatus alongside each other. This necessitates an aesthetic experience that allows both producers and viewers to suffer the ambivalences embedded in the complexities of perception and analysis. And for that, we need complex representations and a processuality that can be transposed into a collective engagement. I had not heard of the common community yet. And that I came at aesthetic experience from an entirely unphilosophical and thus probably quite unsound. And, and I came from a aesthetic, at aesthetic experience from an entirely unphilosophical and thus probably quite unsound angle. Yet a free, a few principles never abated. The idea that multidimensionality must be transmitted in a form that allows for the correspondence of singular entities, be they rare photographic images or artworks in an exhibition, in a dialectical pick of material and meaning. So you're, you're making an exhibition and you, um, uh, you're, you're bringing works together and they need to both stand in for themselves and cohere with each other in such a way where there's, um, they're both apparent as material objects and as objects that produce some meaning. The realization that this can never be done by an artwork alone, because no matter how complex its curatorials a, a curational structure is, it remains a singularity. 
and the insight that any curatorial solution must in turn rely on what the artworks demand. I think I have a, a small after part, but I think that, that we are, we're at the limit. I don't know what the time is, but I have a feeling that maybe this is enough. Um, we're just about the time, but you, if you wanted to wrap up, I think um, people are free to, to, to stay or go as they wish. So um, you're free to, to also wrap up. Yes, I mean, um, maybe just without going into the details, because that's also something I did the last time I talked, 